Um, and so at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Leslie Cooper to you, who is the founding um, president of the board of directors of the Myocarditis Foundation. Um, he is also chief of vascular medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And um, any of you who have visited our website are familiar with or done research in, in uh, medical literature on the subject of myocarditis or giant cell myocarditis, you will note that he is very often the author and um, has, he has done a great deal of research in this field. So at this time, not to waste a second, uh, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Cooper and direct your attention to the slide presentation. Dr. Cooper. Well, thank you, Candace, very much. Uh, I'm Leslie Cooper. I'm a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic with a long-standing interest in myocarditis, uh, both from a clinical and from a research perspective. Um, I'd like to also welcome you. Uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, attend this webinar. I hope it will be useful. Um, uh, just a couple of business items. I took the liberty of slightly modifying the title because I chose to draw a contrast between uh, viral myocarditis, which is quite common, and the rare disorder of giant cell myocarditis, which uh, has been the focus of a lot of, of my work and helps put the rest of the field in perspective. The second item is uh, I learned a few minutes ago that none of the animation or movies will work in my presentation on this webinar, and so I'll apologize in advance for slides that appear to uh, not be moving because uh, of that limitation. And at the end, I'll be glad to take any questions. If at any point uh, the uh, images or uh, what I'm showing are not clear, please save your questions for the end and I'd be happy to answer them. So today's topic, which will, and I'll speak by the way for about 25 to 30 minutes to leave lots of time for questions. Today's topic is, is myocarditis. It's meant as an introduction for the layperson who uh, has, is otherwise um, unfamiliar with the disease. And the, um, I'd like to begin by, by introducing um, a newspaper story of uh, a woman uh, here. It was in the St. Paul Pioneer Press a couple of years ago. Uh, because the title of the story, I think, uh, summarizes one of the great problems we have in myocarditis uh, research and, and the clinical diagnosis and treatment of myocarditis, and that is that it mimics many common disorders. Uh, physicians can usually tell if a myocarditis patient has a heart problem, but figuring out that it is myocarditis and getting to the right treatment is often a great challenge. Fortunately, uh, in this newspaper story, uh, this woman uh, was correctly diagnosed, and she went on to have appropriate therapy and recover completely. Unfortunately, that, that's not usually the case in this disease. I'd like to give a brief historical context to myocarditis. Uh, the first description of the disease was in 1837 in, in Germany by a pathologist, and for the next uh, more than 100 years, uh, the disease was only diagnosed at the time of autopsy by pathologists and thus um, uh, the definitions uh, were all pathologic definitions uh, based on the examination of heart tissue. It wasn't until the 1950s when heart biopsy was first developed that patients could be diagnosed before death with this disorder. And since then, uh, there have been many attempts, which I'll, some of which I'll share with you, to develop less invasive methods of diagnosis. And there's a lot of, of promise in that work today. Um, myocarditis, hang on. Uh, so, although examination of tissue by a heart biopsy is very specific and remains the gold standard for this diagnosis, it's not very sensitive. And the reason is that biopsy only samples a tiny little piece of the heart, and that little piece of the heart may not contain uh, the disease, the active disease. And so there are other forms of diagnostic criteria. The first are based on symptoms. And in my next slide, I'm going to go over the symptoms uh, and the symptom complexes, which are uh, often seen in myocarditis. The universal problem with basing a diagnosis only on symptoms is that they are nonspecific, and there are many other diseases which resemble myocarditis. Uh, there are a number of 
tests of blood, uh, blood tests uh, such as uh, troponin, which is a marker of heart injury, um, and some more specific ones that have been proposed to diagnose myocarditis, they are also very helpful and supportive, but not specific. Similarly, I'll show you illustrations of an abnormal electrocardiogram, which is a very common and easily available test. Here again, very helpful, but not specific. And finally, I'll show examples of magnetic resonance imaging, which is currently the best non-invasive test for the diagnosis and one that we rely on a great deal. There are four common ways that myocarditis presents. The first and most common is with acute heart failure, which is a syndrome where you feel short of breath with walking, sometimes with ankle swelling, uh, excessive fatigue, uh, and that uh, is often associated with an enlarged heart that doesn't pump well. That's called dilated for enlarged cardiomyopathy, meaning disease of the heart muscle. The second uh, most common form is fulminant uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, and that's very similar to the first one, except that it occurs within two weeks of a virus-type syndrome, an upper respiratory tract illness or maybe a, a nausea, vomiting, fever, and chill-type illness. And in those, uh, and that syndrome is more common in children than it is in adults. The third and, and serious presentation is passing out without warning, called syncope. And in those cases where passing out is due to heart, a block of the heart rhythm, or a fast inappropriate heart rate called ventricular tachycardia, prognosis, the likelihood of, of death or transplant is, is poor. There's a, a great risk of progressive disease, and we pay a great deal of attention to looking for myocarditis in that setting. And lastly, uh, a very common presentation is chest pain, chest pain which can resemble a heart attack or, uh, but is often due to inflammation of the lining of the heart. And those patients uh, in whom heart function is preserved usually have a very good prognosis. I'm going to show you some illustrations. This is an electrocardiogram, and it shows uh, what is a subtle but typical finding in acute myocarditis. Uh, the lead labeled V2 is circled, and uh, right after the downslope of that, that sharp downslope, you can see there's a segment which is elevated above the ba baseline of the uh, other segments. That's called the ST segment, and that would be a subtle but uh, very common finding in acute myocarditis. In the same patient on the next day, you can see that that elevation is a little bit lower, just by about a millimeter if you were measuring it. And by the third day, the elevation's gone, but in other leads, uh, the remainder of that segment has changed. The uh, bump is now facing down uh, above V4 rather than up. That's T wave inversion. And those, this is a typical change uh, in acute myocarditis, which um, might be missed because it's really quite subtle um, unless you were thinking of the diagnosis. Uh, this is the first movie I was going to show, and it uh, was supposed to show a normal heart contracting. Uh, you'll have to use your imagination, and uh, this uh, still image still is useful because you can see the exquisite detail of the heart in cross-section that you can get with this type of imaging. The, the black circle in each of these 12 images is a cross-section of the left ventricle of the heart, and you can really uh, see down to two millimeter resolution. Um, when you have damage, such as inflammation or scar, you can see it, even if it affects five or six percent of the heart, uh, quite nicely. I apologize for not having the movie. Here's an example of acute myocarditis. Uh, if you follow the heads of the arrows to the wall of the heart, which is that black um, semi-oval, uh, blood inside is gray, light gray and the muscle of the heart is black, you can see within the muscle there's a white area on the upper part of the heart beyond the upper arrow and on the inferior side of the heart beyond the two lower arrows, and those white areas are active myocarditis uh, seen with MRI. Uh, this is now the non-invasive gold standard for the diagnosis.
Uh, many, many times we don't need to do a heart biopsy because this is such an accurate test. This slide shows uh, the way heart biopsy is done in those cases in whom we need to do it. You can see the bioptome, which is uh, uh, has the metal uh, tip open, uh, closed at the top right, and then gone in the bottom right with a small bite out of the heart tissue of the right ventricle. And that's actually the size of the piece of tissue we look at when we do a heart biopsy. It's very, very small. And uh, you can imagine how you might miss an area of inflammation because of sampling error. But when you do find inflammation, it looks a lot like this. Um, this is a microscope picture, a photomicrograph, of a patient uh, who had giant cell myocarditis. And the heart cells are the reddish ones that are mostly on the left and at the bottom of the picture. And there uh, in the middle is a big giant cell. It's the cell with the dark blue purple nuclei in the middle. And it's much larger than other cells. And this area in the middle the, is all inflammation, which uh, in this case uh, was a very serious form of inflammation which required specific therapy. It was a good thing that a heart biopsy was done. Only about 10% of patients who have myocarditis actually need a heart biopsy. And when a, uh, there are guidelines uh, for when a heart biopsy should be performed uh, for suspected myocarditis. And it's important to emphasize that both uh, the European literature as well as this slide, which illustrates the actual recommendation for the US uh, uh, physicians, it's the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association's guidelines for the management of heart failure in adults, uh, they recommend appropriately that heart biopsy should not be routinely performed because it's a risky procedure and the vast majority of people will not have diagnostic tests. However, there are specific times when a heart biopsy should be performed and those are outlined in a different document, uh, which I had the privilege of uh, leading the, the author group on. Uh, and this is a joint US and European document on the role of heart biopsy in the management of all forms of cardiovascular disease. And uh, essentially, the essence comes down to when patients who have suspected myocarditis with either with heart failure or arrhythmias fail to respond to usual care or have a particularly severe presentation, a biopsy should be done. Um, and this document, which is, goes into great detail about how to do it and what to do with the uh, tissue after it's captured, um, is very, very useful. This is the guidance document that is currently uh, used both in the US and in Europe uh, for the performance of heart biopsy. That uh, really covers what I, an, a very high-level overview of uh, when you should do a biopsy uh, for this disease and when you should um, consider imaging. Um, I'll, there are many questions you probably have, and I'll be happy to take them in a few minutes. I'd like to review the causes of myocarditis uh, briefly. And the most common cause in North America and Europe are viruses. There are about 20 viruses that cause myocarditis, and many of them are quite common. Out of 1,000 people who might get an influenza uh, infection during influenza season, one or 200 may have subclinical myocarditis, meaning a change in the electrocardiogram or uh, a rise in biomarkers of cardiac injury. And in those patients, there are no symptoms of heart disease. But in a small number, maybe 50 out of 1,000, you will get symptoms of heart failure or chest pain. And in those 50, uh, 30 or more will recover without incident. And about 20 out of the original 1,000 will go on to have a significant uh, heart problem. So uh, the important picture here is this is true for all the viruses that affect the heart. The vast majority of people are unaffected and those who, the vast majority of people who are affected get better. Uh, this slide shows a picture of heart tissue under a microscope. Uh, and there are three cells here in black which are infected with a virus called 
Coxsackie uh, virus B, CVB, and it shows the reason why heart biopsy is not very sensitive, and that is that only three out of what are 50 or 80 cells here are actually infected. The other ones are, are free of infection and have no inflammation or any abnormalities. But this kind of infection, where only three out of 50 or 100 cells are involved, is enough to cause heart failure. So the histology is far from perfect. The no this slide illustrates the changing spectrum of viruses. The first viruses that were described as a cause of myocarditis were in 1948 in the Hudson River Valley north of New York. Uh, Coxsackie A and B were isolated then. And over the next 30 years or so, uh, Coxsackie became the most common cause of myocarditis. Today, however, it is responsible for less than 10% of cases. Instead, over the last 20 years, uh, first uh, human herpes virus 6 toward the right there and Epstein-Barr virus became quite common and now most recently a different virus called parvovirus B19 or PVB19 is the most common uh, virus associated with myocarditis. Uh, who knows what will happen in the next 10 years uh, that we may switch back to the older viruses or there be, may be new viruses that we have yet to detect which will be the primary causes of myocarditis in the developing world. Having said that, in the non-developed world, uh, in Asia, in South America, in Africa, there are many other causes. And this slide is supposed to be animated. There are about seven or eight different photographs which were layered here, but I apologize, I can't unlayer them. Um, they were to illustrate the other causes, this scorpion in front was the last one that in Israel and, and India, uh, after a scorpion bite, the risk of myocarditis is about 50%. It's an uncommon event, but when it happens, it, it's a toxic form of myocarditis. It, the other slides illustrate uh, other types of infections. Uh, Lyme disease, for example, uh, is common in some parts of this country. Uh, Chagas disease is, a, is an infection in South and Central America that's very important. And in uh, AIDS, an HIV infection, there are specific reasons why patients get cardiomyopathy and sometimes myocarditis. AIDS is a huge problem in Sub-Saharan Africa, and so uh, those patients are not primarily, uh, are, are have a different spectrum of reasons for myocarditis. In addition, there are many uh, uncommon but very important non-infectious causes. Uh, after viruses and, and the bacteria that we just talked about, uh, giant cell myocarditis is perhaps the most important. It's generally not infectious. It's usually a, a kind of allergic reaction against your heart. Uh, it, there are many triggers, and I'll show you some data on that. And it's very important because if you make the diagnosis early, and treat patients appropriately with certain immunosuppressive drugs, you can prevent uh, transplantation or uh, what used to be 100% mortality is now often uh, manageable or, or even potentially curable. Um, like giant cell myocarditis, there are drug reactions, sometimes to uh, medications, sometimes to vaccines which uh, can cause a significant adverse reaction in the heart. They also have specific treatments. Toxins like the, the scorpion bite I mentioned, alcohol in high doses can cause inflammation and damage to the heart, and it makes viral infections worse. And then there is an autoimmune form of cardiomyopathy where there's a lot of inflammation or chronic myocarditis, even in the absence of an infection. I, I mention those because I, for completeness, but also because uh, worldwide there probably are uh, important causes uh, other than infectious uh, disease. This slide is just an example of uh, cardiac injury following smallpox vaccination. You may know there are over 3 million U.S. servicemen and women who have been vaccinated for smallpox uh, over the last decade and uh, most received the YF Drivax vaccine. The new one uh, in the last two years is the ACAM 2000 vaccine. In this study last year, uh, Renata Engler uh, 
looked at 500 patients who had been vaccinated um, and found that almost 1% of them had uh, a rise in troponin and one in 500 uh, approximately had uh, clinical myocarditis. Uh, this is a very high number when you consider uh, three million people were vaccinated. Uh, obviously, that would translate to thousands of affected individuals. Uh, now, that's an unusual vaccine. Most clinically available vaccines are very, very safe, and uh, you shouldn't be worried about, in general, about getting myocarditis from a vaccine but it's to illustrate uh, a well-described uh, side effect. Similar things happen uh, following various antibiotics or uh, anti-seizure medications. This is my only complicated slide, and I don't want to overwhelm you with it, but only to say that there are two points to take away from it. At the top of the slide, you can see a picture of a virus. Uh, it's blue, and it has 20 sides, and it's supposed to be a representative of a Coxsackie virus. But it could be any virus, and it could be any drug or toxin causing initial heart injury. And you see the heart at the top of the slide is supposed to be normal in size, and the heart at the bottom of the slide is, is enlarged. And the point of the slide is how do you get from a normal heart to a big heart that pumps poorly following an initial infection? The answer is basically two ways. You can either have a persistent infection, which your immune system fails to clear, or you can have inappropriate uh, immune activation after a viral infection. Your heart, I mean, your immune system can mistake your heart for a foreign body or a virus. There are a number of specific ways that happens. And if it does happen, you can reject your heart, uh, just the way patients who've had heart transplants can undergo rejection because it's a foreign uh, heart in their body. So patients who have had myocarditis can undergo something similar to rejection because um, of a mistake in the immune system. And the challenge is identifying those patients and distinguishing them from most people who do not have that problem. Um, what is the prognosis if you have myocarditis? Um, these, this slide illustrates the survival uh, without transplantation of about 132 people with acute myocarditis seen at Johns Hopkins in the 1980s and 90s. And over 10 years, there was about a 50% rate of death or transplant, which is approximately 5% per year. I think that's a fair number. And to data today are very similar, that there's about a 4% risk of death or transplant in year one, and again, about four, two to 4% 4 in year two, and then about 2% per year after that with current 2010 medical therapy. That includes all men and women, but only adults. I think uh, the prognosis and, and the management in children is different. Um, Dr. Steph Cooper, you, may I just excuse you for one minute? You skipped slide number 23, and I think that that may be important for our, our listening audience. 23. 20, what are the complications of myocarditis? 23. There you go. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Yeah, sometimes when I, uh, I apologize to the listeners, sometimes if I click on this button to advance, it's, it's, it sometimes goes two slides instead of one. This is important, and it was the introduction to the last slide. The, uh, thank you, Candace. Um, what are the complications of myocarditis? And it's important to note that most people who have the disease recover with no short-term problems. And by short-term, I mean three to five years. And I limit it to that because in adults, we really don't know beyond five to 10 years what the long-term risks are. There's a suggestion in children uh, that uh, at 10 and 20 and 30 years following diagnosis that there's a recurrence of heart failure. We do not know that for adults. Um, a small percentage of people, uh, perhaps 20 to 25%, who initially present with heart failure will develop chronic heart failure. 
And again, 10 to 20 percent of people who present with a chest pain syndrome may actually develop a chronic form of that. And then, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the third bullet point here repeats what I said earlier, that the, today the chance of uh, death or transplant is 4 percent in year one, and 2 to 4 percent in year two, and about 2 percent in following years. And that's the slide I showed before. And then this was to point out that those data uh, on survival are based on people who are able to get to a clinic. And those people who die suddenly are not included in those studies, but rather reported in a separate literature published by pathologists in autopsy series. And the range uh, the, in young people who die uh, suddenly the, the frequency of myocarditis varies between 5 and 20 percent. This uh, paper, which I'm showing data from on 3,000 autopsies in Australia, had a 12 percent rate of myocarditis, and I think that is a good average. Uh, 10 to 15 percent is quite representative of the world literature. And of course, there's a huge challenge in identifying patients who are at risk because they tend to have no symptoms before they die suddenly. This is a, another uh, newspaper story of a man who uh, developed giant cell myocarditis. He actually did well in the long run after a heart transplant, but uh, the, at the point of this slide is to say that if you properly diagnose these diseases and you get appropriate care, that even if you need a transplant, the long-term outcome can be excellent. And, um, and he did very well and uh, actually um, shared his story in the newspaper. Um, this uh, skipped again ahead. The um, survival varies by cause. So lymphocytic myocarditis, which is the common viral associated myocarditis, has pretty good prognosis. This slide shows a similar data set to the one I showed earlier. In red, the survival over five years of patients with lymphocytic myocarditis is illustrated. And again, there's about a 5% to 10, and this is an older series, to 10% per year risk of death or transplant. That's a little bit better now. But in contrast, in the green, you can see the survival of patients with giant cell myocarditis, which is much worse. There's only a 50% uh, survival at six months and overall a 90% risk of death or transplant overall. And that's why it's important to try and identify those patients who would respond to specific therapy. The next slide focuses on children. Um, I don't know if, if anyone listening has had uh, uh, children who were affected by myocarditis, but uh, the prognosis is uh, overall a bit better than for children who have cardiomyopathy of other reasons, but nonetheless, at, uh, you can see in this slide, which was supposed to be animated, that there is about a 2 to 3 percent risk of death or transplant in the myocarditis group, uh, certainly over the first few years. It's actually more like a 10 percent risk in year one, and then it, the risk goes down uh, substantially after that. So again, a high-risk situation in children, but better than if you had an inherited or metabolic uh, cardiomyopathy. What are the predictors of death or transplant? In uh, adults, uh, the shorter duration of therapy, uh, of, I'm sorry, shorter duration of illness is generally associated with better recovery. Um, but the more severe the heart damage, as reflected by a decrease in the ejection fraction, which is the amount of blood the heart pumps, or higher pressures in the heart, or higher pressures that lead to failure of the right ventricle, uh, those are all predictors of death or transplant. And it turns out that men do a bit worse than women, slightly. Um, there's no difference by, by age within adults. And then uh, present, presentation with uh, passing out is also a risk uh, for death or transplant in acute myocarditis. So when to suspect the very bad disease, giant cell myocarditis? 
it turns out that you can generally identify this disease uh, by clinical features and an electrocardiogram uh, and a physical examination. And the people who are at highest risk of giant cell myocarditis either have bad arrhythmias, um, heart block, and pass out or lose consciousness because of that, and uh, who you treat appropriately but who fail to respond to usual care. You give the right medicines and the patients get worse even though they get the right care. Those are, are the three uh, universally regarded reasons to do a heart biopsy uh, for that diagnosis. This slide uh, simply shows uh, a variety of disorders, most of them associated with autoimmunity, which have been described in association with giant cell myocarditis. You can see that uh, they range from inflammatory bowel disease to inflammatory thyroid disease, vasculitis, uh, inflammatory diseases of the skin, and some tumors that are uh, associated with uh, lymphocytes like lymphoma or thymoma where the thymus is where lymphocytes mature. So uh, this is only to say in uh, clinical practice, uh, those patients who present with probable myocarditis who have one of, or more of these disorders often get a heart biopsy. Um, I'm only going to say a little bit about treatment, and that'll be the end of my presentation. Um, the most important thing to remember about treatment is that the guidelines that are, have been written for much more common diseases are completely relevant to myocarditis. All the medicines that we use in the usual care of patients with heart failure and arrhythmias, we use those same medicines in myocarditis with a good efficacy. There are, a couple of, there's, there are a couple of things that are specific for myocarditis. One is to avoid aerobic exercise because aerobic exercise makes the inflammation worse. Um, as well, avoiding alcohol uh, acutely makes the inflammation worse. Um, toward the end of my presentation here, this is, a, a, again, a newspaper story from uh, one of our local newspapers here in the Midwest of a young girl, 17 years old, who uh, developed uh, an acute uh, giant cell myocarditis, very, very sick, but was able to get bridged uh, to uh, a heart transplant and do beautifully. And she's actually uh, in the story back um, exercising uh, and participating in school sports just as she did before she became ill. So I want to, to end this on a note of hope that uh, even if uh, it's a very serious form of myocarditis, or if it's a very serious um, presentation of a common form of myocarditis, uh, we often are very successful today in helping people. I'm going to skip over the next couple of slides intentionally uh, because of time, and I want to leave lots of time for questions. And I'm going to go right over to the last slide, which is uh, about the Myocarditis Foundation. Uh, if you haven't visited our website already, uh, we have a lot of information. Uh, there's a chat room and uh, opportunities to communicate with, with other people who may have been affected by the disease. And we also uh, give out research grants. Uh, we try to give three grants a year, and uh, this year the grant submission deadline is December 1st. Uh, and um, if any of you on the line are, are researchers, I'd encourage you to uh, consider a grant submission. And with that, I'd be glad to take questions.